In our previous video, we looked at how we could describe the general features of functions. Here in this video, we will look at the, the most common types or families of functions that we'd expect to see. These functions will include polynomials, power laws, exponentials and logs, the trigonomic and the hyperbolic functions. Firstly, let's look at the polynomial functions. These tend to be the simplest functions to solve and to analyze. And they're essentially combinations of powers of x, the coefficients that go along with those powers, and constants. The generalized form of a polynomial is an ever-increasing series of powers of x with the coefficients a and constants such as a0. The domain of polynomials tends to be all real numbers, such numbers between minus infinity and plus infinity. Polynomials are also defined by the highest power of the x or degree such that for a x to the power of 1 we would refer to it as a first degree or linear, a second degree would be referred to as a quadratic, and a third degree a cubic and so on. We can simply invent examples of these functions such as a linear. Here it's equal to 13x plus 2 where 2 is the value of the y-intercept and 13 is the gradient of that linear function. x squared minus 4x plus 2 is a simple quadratic and x cubed plus x minus 3 is a simple example of a cubic. Notice also that as we increase the power or degree in a polynomial, we get an extra turning point in the curve. Visually, we can see that the degree of the function determines its symmetry. This can be described in terms of odd or even symmetry. So if all the terms in the polynomial are, have odd powers, we'd expect an odd symmetry. And if all the terms in the polynomial have even powers, then we'd expect an even symmetry. If it's a mixture of odd and even power values, we'd expect neither a explicit odd or even symmetry. Using negative powers is also possible in polynomials. And here we tend to see discontinuities occur as we approach x equal to zero. But again, even with negative powers, we can start to visualize the symmetries of these polynomials similarly having even and odd features, such that the functions only go negative for odd powers of x. And in this example, x to the power of minus 2 has an even symmetry. It has a reflection through the y-axis, whereas x to the power of minus 1 or x to the power of minus 3 has an odd symmetry, such that it's a reflection through the origin. Power law functions are essentially single-term polynomials, or monomials. We bring attention to this family of functions since we tend to see power laws throughout science. In physics, for example, we have the inverse power laws of forces, and there are a variety of other phenomena in biology and social sciences that can be modeled effectively in using power laws. Indeed, the presence of a power law can hint at some underlying random process. Examples of this would include the size and number of craters on the moon, the magnitude of observed solar flares, the frequency of words, and indeed family names in different languages. A classic example in biology is basal metabolic rate. This is the rate of, of energy expenditure for different animals of different mass. Smaller animals tend to lose heat much faster than larger animals due to their greater surface area to volume ratio. Hence, they have to generate much more energy per kilogram of mass than much larger animals. For example, a 40 gram shrew has over 10 times the resting metabolic rate per kilogram of body mass compared to a 4 ton elephant. Many measurements of this metabolic rate for different sized animals has revealed a power of the order of minus 0.75, which is an example of a non-integer power. While power law functions raise x to some fixed value of power, exponential functions, on the other hand, the power is x, and so it's not constant, and so neither is the rate of change. The result of this increasing rate of change is that the function value can change very rapidly as the input changes. And indeed, depending on the sign of the exponential, we can have exponential decay where the function value diminishes rapidly or indeed exponential rise where the function is increasing rapidly. 
we can look at a simple example where we use the base a is equal to 10 and 10 to the power of x is an exponential increase 10 to the power of minus x is an, is an exponential decay for the domain we can accept all real numbers between minus infinity and plus infinity and for the range as long as the base is positive we will end up with positive numbers a special choice for the base is to use the rational number e like pi e has an infinite number of digits the first four are 2.718 using e as the base for our exponential we can have again a positive or a negative exponential what is special about this is that the exponential to the base c has a value equal to its rate of change. In our future lecture on differentiation, we will see that the derivative of e to the x is simply e to the x. For example, the value of e to the x at 0 0.5 is 1.65, which is exactly the value of its rate of change or slope at that point. In science, if a variable or growth decay is proportional to its size, then it can be modeled very well using the function e to the power of plus or minus t, such that we can get exponential decay or increase of some population of things. For example, in physics, we have the famous radioactive decay, where it's the population of radioactive particles decaying with some time constant tau. The inverse of exponential functions are referred to as logarithms and originally logarithms were introduced to aid calculation before the advent of computers. If we look at the exponential function 10 to the power of x we can use the example that 10 to the power of 2 is 100 and the inverse of this would be mapping from 100 to 2 so that the log of 100 to the base 10 is equal to 2. And if we, like we used in the previous video, reflect the original function through the line y equals to x, we will see what the inverse function looks like. And if we're using the exponential to the base e, the inverse of this is referred to as natural log. So that's log to the base e, which can be written also as simply ln. Besides being a useful tool to perform manual computations, logs are also very useful for compressing large variation. For example, we can convert a huge variation in, in a variable such as x to a much smaller range of variation in a variable y. In this example, we're using to the base 10, and it will reduce the domain of x which spans 1 to a million to simply 1 to 6. There are many famous applications of such log scales. This includes the decibel or the sound intensity scale. Sound intensity provides us with the value of power per area that the sound wave carries. Typically this can vary over almost 20 orders of magnitude. The decibel scale compresses this huge variation to two orders of magnitude. Another famous application of logarithmic scales is the Richter scale. And the Richter scale converts the energy or the seismic energy released to a log scale. Here again, we are seeing a compression of over 20 orders of magnitude, in this case in energy, to one order of magnitude on the Richter scale. Trigonometry functions associate the sides of a right-angled triangle to its angles. The utility here is that if a single angle and a side are known, then the others can be calculated. For a right-angled triangle with some angle theta, these sides are typically referred to as the adjacent side, the side opposite, and the longest side, which is referred to as the hypotenuse. The three basic trigonometry functions are the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse, which is referred to as the cosine. The sine function is the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse. And the tangent is the ratio of the opposite to the adjacent. Since the input angle can be 0 to 360 degrees, 
These trigonometry functions are typically defined using a unit circle. Here the radius of the circle is equal to 1, so the hypotenuse is equal to 1. Then the sine and the cosine functions reduce to simply being equal to the opposite and the adjacent side respectively. As the angle increases, the value of these ratios change and repeat periodically for each cycle around the circle. And indeed, because of their periodic nature, Trigonometry functions are used frequently in physics to model phenomena that oscillate. For certain angles, we can determine the value of these functions, such as if the angle is equal to zero. Using the unit circle, we can say that the opposite will be equal to zero, but the adjacent and the hypotenuse will be equal to one. And hence, we can determine that the sine of this zero angle will be zero since the opposite is zero. The cosine will be equal to one, since the adjacent and hypotenuse are equal to one, and the tangent will be zero. If we move on to an angle such as pi over two or 90 degrees, in this case, the opposite will be equal to one, but the adjacent will be zero, and the hypotenuse will also be equal to one. And hence, sine will be equal to one, so the sine of 90 degrees is one, the cosine of 90 will be zero, but the tangent of 90 degrees will be undefined since it's equal to one divided by zero. Using such examples, we can determine that the functions all range between minus one and one, except the tan, which is undefined, or it's, it's not a continuous function. If we visualize sine and cosine, we can see that they're out of phase by pi over two, 90 degrees. Visualizing the tangent function, on the other hand, reveals vertical asymptotes where the function goes to infinity as the angle approaches odd numbers of pi over 2. When you begin to study the topic of complex numbers, you will also see how these trigonometry functions can be defined using the exponential function together with the imaginary number i. We can demonstrate this quite easily if we combine two exponentials to the base e. Here we've got e to the x plus e to the minus x. This gives us a curve that combines an exponential decay on the left with an exponential rise on the right, all to the base e. Next, if we add the imaginary number i into the power of the exponentials, we suddenly get a oscillating function. Notice the amplitude here is 2 and minus 2. So if we simply divide by 2, our amplitude now is constrained between 1 and minus 1. And indeed, this determines a cosine function. Similarly so, the sine function is also definable in terms of exponentials and the imaginary number i. And since tangent is simply the ratio of the sine divided by the cosine, that too can be defined in terms of i and e. Since these functions are periodic, there will be many values of x that will have the same value of y. So we have a many to one mapping. Hence, if we want to determine the inverse functions of these trigonometry functions, we will have to realize that there will be multiple values that can be determined from a single output. So we've got no unique mapping. And in order to de define an inverse function, we have to restrict the domain of the original function. And in the case of sine x or sine theta, we restrict the domain between minus pi over two and plus pi over two. This is similarly the case for the inverse tan function, but for inverse cosine, it's restricted from zero to pi. If we visualize the form of the curves of these inverse trig functions, we will see the red curve is now the inverse sine. And notice how we write the inverse or arc sine as a power to the minus one. So we can see for inverse sine, we've got a domain now of minus one to one being mapped on to minus pi over two to plus pi over two. For cosine, the range, as we said earlier, is from zero to pi. The inverse tan function has a much greater domain since it includes all the natural numbers between minus infinity and plus infinity. Its range again, however, is minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. Next, let's look at hyperbolic functions. Whereas the standard trigonometry functions are based on the equation of the circle, 
Hyperbolic functions are based on the equation of the hyperbola. This equation has the form of x squared minus y squared is equal to 1. And the geometry defined by hyperbolic functions have numerous applications in physics. In order to define these hyperbolic functions, let's visualize a unit hyperbola. And here we're going to just use the right hand side of this function. For any value of x and y, we can define an area from the origin to the point on the curve, and we refer to this area as the hyperbolic angle, which we call t here. As we vary the size of this hyperbolic angle, we can define the hyperbolic sine as the vertical or y component, and the hyperbolic cosine as the horizontal or x component. The domain of these functions will be all the natural numbers. So the shaded area t, this hyperbolic angle, can vary between minus infinity and plus infinity. Both of these hyperbolic functions look very similar. In fact, in terms of the positive domain, they completely overlap as we get towards t equals to 1. However, for the negative values of t, hyperbolic cosine will remain positive, but hyperbolic sine will go negative. For hyperbolic tan, again, like in the basic trigonometry functions, it is simply the ratio of the sine divided by the cosine. And as we can see for the domain of t, the range of hyperbolic tan goes to 1. We can see that both hyperbolic cosine and sine are equivalent and produce a ratio of 1. Similar to the basic trigonometry functions, hyperbolic functions can also be defined as combinations of exponentials to the base e. The key difference here is that these exponential combinations do not include the imaginary number i. Next, let's look at the inverse of these hyperbolic functions. As we showed in an earlier video, for any function we can define its inverse. In the case of hyperbolic functions, it is no surprise that the inverse will include logarithms to the base e, since we are defining them initially as functions in terms of exponentials to the base e. The first step in determining the inverse function is to define it in terms of x. And then we will solve this equation to determine y as a function of x. To do so, we'll multiply everything by e to the power of y. This gives us what looks like a quadratic equation. And we can solve this equation using our basic roots of the quadratic equation formula. The coefficients here are 1 minus 2x and minus 1. And once we enter in those coefficients, we can then solve the equation as 2x plus or minus the root of 4 by root x squared minus 1, all divided by 2. We can simplify this, of course, as x plus or minus the root of x squared plus 1. And in the case of our functions, we expect only positive values. So we have e to the y is equal to x plus the root of x squared plus 1. And then using natural log, we can remove the exponential and give us our final result of y is equal to log of x plus root x squared plus 1. And that's our inverse hyperbolic sine. Let's repeat this exercise for the hyperbolic cosine function. So in order to determine the inverse hyperbolic cosine, we once again swap the variables x and y, and we have the equation now in terms of exponentials, and we wish to solve this equation for y in terms of x. And again, we use a natural log, and hyperbolic inverse cosine is log of x plus root x squared minus 1. These derivations provide us with an excuse to practice manipulating exponential and log functions. So let's continue and derive the inverse hyperbolic tan. This again is defined as the ratio of the hyperbolic sine and cosine functions. If we express this in terms of exponentials to the base e, we can then proceed to isolate e to the power of y such that we can solve for y. After multiplying across by e to the power of y, we can add the powers y plus y, and we get 2y. If we get the square root of both sides, we end up having our equation in terms of e to the y, and again, multiplying across by log to the base e, we can determine the value of y as a function of x.
and here hyperbolic tan is equal to a half log 1 plus x, 1 minus x. Visualizing these functions then can enable us to determine very quickly their domains and ranges. Inverse hyperbolic sine, of course, has all the natural numbers as its domain and range. For the inverse hyperbolic cosine, we can see from our curve that the domain starts and includes at 1, and it continues all the way up until in up until infinity. The range of hyperbolic cosine includes zero, and again it increases all the way up until infinity. The domain of inverse hyperbolic tan includes the values between but not including minus one and one, and its range are all the natural numbers between minus infinity and infinity. As mentioned earlier, there are many applications of hyperbolic functions, particularly in physics. The simplest one is the shape of a suspended cable or string. This is referred to as a catenary. Such a function can be defined using the equation of y is equal to some constant c plus a hyperbolic cosine of x over a. Hyperbolic functions are also present in the theory of relativity, particularly in relativistic transformations. Here we have a world line diagram showing us the history of an object moving and accelerating towards the speed of light. Time is on the vertical axis and space is on the horizontal axis. We can see that the world line history of the object forms a hyperbolic curve in blue. And we can see that the object never quite accelerates towards the speed of light, which is defined or indicated by the 45 degree asymptotes. Another area where you're likely to see hyperbolic functions appear are dealing with wave equations, particularly uh, solutions to the second order partial derivatives. Finally, let's summarize what we've covered in this video with a checklist. Firstly, we've, we've learned to recognize standard functions and we've learned to utilize these together with their inverse functions. We should now be able to also define the domain and ranges of these standard functions and be capable of using trigonometric and hyperbolic identities. Of course, this is just a starting point. Please continue to use your textbook and to study for more details.